welcome to the Risk Out and ACBA Cannabis Banking Research Webinar. We're so delighted to have you today. So here's the plan. Our presenters are going to take us through the issues, and we'll take your questions at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to send your questions as they occur to you by going to the chat feature on your control panel and simply text chat those questions into the organizer. We're here today with Kristen Parker, who is Risk Scout's VP of Compliance and Operations. And prior to joining Risk Scout, Kristen worked on both fraud and BSA teams, where she successfully created and implemented one of the first Federal Reserve Bank approved hemp onboarding and ongoing monitoring programs. She was also recently selected by peers as PBC's Compliance Person of the Year, and we're very excited to have her joining us today, along with Michael Beard, who is the founding partner of the ACBA. And Michael is responsible for driving the strategic vision of the organization. He has over 40 years experience in financial services and provides leading edge consulting, education and research to the industry practitioners in the cannabis banking space. Kristen and Mike, we're delighted to have you. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, Kristen and I would like to welcome everyone to today's events covering our current ACBA Risk Doubt research for 2024. Little background, we were in the field with our survey during Q3 of last year and are pleased to provide everyone with the latest insights into what's on the mind of bank bankers and credit union professionals who are either curious about what's going on with cannabis banking today or are already considered seasoned experts. Today, we'll level set with some information on the state of the cannabis industry and then dive into some highlights from this year's survey. We'll then wrap up with a summary of findings, as well as some critical recommendations that you can and should implement immediately. So let's get started. First, Kristen, would you like to talk a little about who is Risk Scout? Yeah, absolutely. Risk Scout was designed to help community financial institutions of all sorts of sizes streamline their onboarding and ongoing compliance efforts for their generally higher risk based clients. Uh, so we help institutions all over the US with different programs like cannabis, help them streamline their banking as a service processes, international and non-resident, you name it, we help with it. But one of our uh, founding purposes was to help financial institutions with cannabis uh, banking. So we work with institutions all over the U.S. to help them shore up uh, existing programs, help them start new ones from scratch. We are there to hold hands through that whole process. So I like to say we've seen it all, but we know that's a lie because this industry changes quite a bit. So we have seen a lot. And, uh, you know, I've personally ran these programs myself. I think it's important that you know who we are so that you should understand uh, our experiences and, and uh when you have cheeks in the seats experience, it, it really goes a long way of knowing what it's like to run a program day to day. So I'm excited, Mike. Thanks for having us to do this with you. And let's get started. Well, we certainly are excited about partnering with Risk Scout on this endeavor. Uh, for those who don't know, the ACBA, the American Cannabis Bankers Association, uh, really has its original roots in two decades of online bank education and training. Uh, Bankers of a Banker College uh, were founded both by myself and by Aaron O'Donnell um, and launched the industry's first cannabis banking professional certification back in 2020. We were very excited by that. And as a result of the popularity and success of that program in 2023, the ACBA was officially launched on stage at Monday 2020 to kick off last year's uh, Cannabis Summit track that they had uh, kicking off Monday 2020. And we're also pleased to announce that the ACBA was uh, selected and chosen by uh, Wiley Publishers to publish the definitive book on cannabis banking due out first quarter 2025 entitled Cannabis Banking, the Legal Framework and Practical Solutions for Cultivating Compliance. So we're very excited by that. So let's get into the current state of cannabis banking. With the recent release of MJ Biz Daily 2023 industry research, there have been a number of shifts of trends and, and changes that are certainly worth noting, especially if your institution is just now considering getting into this area. MJ Biz has seen several metrics pointing to some challenges that have emerged in the cannabis industry. These challenges, as witnessed over the last several years, include increased competition, 
especially in states uh, west of the Rockies, where they're, they've got more of a mature market, and we're seeing competitors pop up now in many cities. Um, Overrepresentation and licensing in new markets, including Massachusetts and Michigan, as well as the ACBA's home state of New Mexico. Next, recent layoffs uh, from consolidations and closures, increasing in overbuilt states, as well as cost management and containment resulting in CRB failures and or acquisition of licenses by larger players within the industry. Taken in whole, however, these are offset largely by more states continuing to expand access to both medical and recreational cannabis, creating more competition, more industry, and more revenue. So you can see that uh, still as we head towards 2030, this is an industry that is going to have an impact uh, significantly with or without the banking industry. But as you'll hear, hopefully the banking industry will come along to help support uh, cannabis. So with the recent elections in November of last year, there are now 43 states that have either medical only, that would be just 17 states, or both uh, medical and cannabis, now 24 states for a total of 41. And as you can see on the bottom of here, the chronological timetable uh, shows just how fast and quickly the wave has consumed states moving to both medical and then over to recreational. As of today, more than 80% of the population now have access to cannabis in some form, with that number promising to grow even more by 2030 based on state plans from several of the remaining states that have not yet uh, legalized either, including states like Wisconsin, that are now considering medical cannabis uh, in the next couple of years. So we see this number by 2030 continuing to increase and grow. Uh, SARS filings, many of you on, on this webinar today probably know that FinCEN has estimated the number of financial institutions involved in banking cannabis based on the number of SARS filings or suspicious activity reports filed for CRB activity as required by the cold memo. And as far as the trend line for SARS filings go, while absolute filings continue to increase, that's that blue line that you see here, um, you can see that the overall quarter over quarter uh, percentage change continues to decline with the trend line, that little orange dotted line, uh, continuing to trend downward simply because uh, we're starting to re reach uh, law of diminishing returns. The growth on SARS filings continue to go up, but at a smaller percentage. So what does all that mean? Um, there has been a, a trend over the last couple of years where FinCEN's numbers on SARS filings have been used to estimate the number of institutions currently uh, banking cannabis. I think, however, when you talk to most experts within the industry, uh, they'll agree that that number is, is uh, greatly overstated since SARS filings are not necessarily representative of a bank that has committed to banking cannabis the way many institutions do today. Um, the statistic used to estimate has been between 750 and 800 institutions banking cannabis, but most experts within the field feel that that number is probably about half of that between three and 400 institutions. Um, so it would be a great overstatement to say that uh, 800 banks are or credit unions are actually banking cannabis in a proactive sense. Uh, that number is probably closer to 300. Uh, and 50 to 400. So the opportunity for institutions still considering to get into the industry continues to remain uh, very significant. Yeah, Mike, just to add a little bit to that yes, Chris. too, I think it's important as we watch the trends over time that when well, this trending starts in 2014 and goes to quarter two of 2023, we didn't have the uh, hemp legalized you know, federally until 2018 into 2019. So we still have institutions I talked to today that still think that hemp is cannabis. Well, you know, it is in its own right, right? <laughs> but hemp falls into the illegal status because there are still so many bankers that don't pay attention uh, that feel are still thinking they have to file SARS on those that they find have made their way into their institution. So that's another reason for overstatement here is that there's still a lot of bankers out there who don't, who frankly just don't pay attention to what is legal and what's not legal, um, who's in their backyard, what the opportunities are in their backyard. So they're filing SARS when they don't really even need to be on, on an industry that's been legal for a long time. Now, I know this is focused on, you know, THC cannabis, but I think it, 
it's really important that there's still a very, very big competitive nature out there of uh, where you have the ability, where the market isn't. This this could lead you to believe that the market is oversaturated with banks that are serving the industry. When, you know, Mike is right in saying that it's got to be half, if not less than half of this, that's actually out there actively. And actively could mean also that they only have two or three uh, cannabis customers, and maybe they only have them because they've kind of been strong-armed by their biggest clients into creating a program because their biggest clients want to get into cannabis. The bank doesn't want to, but they don't want to lose their biggest client, so they create a program, have two or three customers, that existing customers in that program, and continue to file SARS just on those. So again, don't I, I think this is just such a falsehood here and what they're, what they're reporting and just keep it with a grain of salt when you're having those conversations because you're going to get that rebuttal back from, you know, if you're trying to create a program and you're trying to go to bat for a program, this is going to be something that people rebuttal you with saying, look, at this is oversaturated, but it clearly, clearly is um, misleading. Well, and you bring up a great point, Kristen. I want to highlight that time frame that you mentioned uh, a moment ago, 2018, 2019, you actually see the spike in the FinCEN SARS reporting occurring then. And what's really fascinating, has been fascinating ever since then, is the number of credit unions and, and banks that are filing the SARS hasn't changed. I mean, it's a flat line. If you look from 2018, yeah. 2019 on, that's not increasing, which kind of tells you there's a lot of confusion within these numbers. As you said, you've got bank filing SARS on hemp and, and things that they don't need to. And we already know you have a lot of banks that are not filing SARS simply because they feel like because they're in a state where it's still illegal that there's no need to. Um, and I always use the example in the research when we were based out of Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin's a state that, as I had mentioned earlier, still does not permit medical or recreational cannabis. However, because they are surrounded uh, by states like Illinois and Minnesota who uh, do have a market there, that we know that a dispensary like Sunnyside Dispensary, which is just between Rockford and Madison, right on, and when I say right on the border, I mean like 600 yards off the border of Wisconsin, is packed every day with Wisconsin license plates. And we know many of the employees are probably Wisconsin residents who work there and therefore are depositing their income and their paychecks or their cash into Wisconsin-based bank accounts. So we know that there's a lot of exposure and confusion out there for the reason that you mentioned, Kristen. It's just, um, they still haven't quite figured out a, a an accurate way of identifying which banks truly are banking cannabis as a proactive measure and those that actually feel like they're protected because they don't need to track anything. Exactly, exactly. Um, and we won't read through this, but I wanted to make sure we also included a slide around the current status of the pending legislation in Washington. We know this is very confusing. It, it's one of those things we get asked a lot on between um, the State Banking Act, which passed the House back in 2021. I mean, we've been talking about the State Banking Act now for a couple of years. Um, the Safer Banking Act, which uh, started in the Senate and has come out of committee and is still awaiting a floor vote. And then the State Act, which most people don't really think much about, but that's the rescheduling of cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. And um, we were actually on a call yesterday talking about this, which brings up really interesting concepts. A lot of people don't feel as though the State Act for the rescheduling will necessarily drive a lot of banks now into cannabis who now said, I've just been waiting for the State Act to reschedule cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 now that they've done it. Uh, you know, we're we're really fired up and ready to go. Um, but a lot of points have been brought up that that's not going to necessarily eliminate the confusion either, because there's a lot of requirements pending uh, and put on um, companies at Schedule 3 from the part of the pharmaceutical industry that will then potentially put a lot of new requirements on dispensaries and producers uh, to meet standards that frankly, haven't really been established yet within the industry. So we see each one of these pieces of legislation having um, a lot of benefit to move the discussion forward, whether they're going to pass anytime soon remains open, and just passage of these doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Um, any other thoughts, Kristen, from, from Risk Scout's perspective? Listen, I, I, I quit holding my breath a long if I still hold my breath for every time I thought this was going to pass I'd be dead about 17 times by now okay I don't want 
I I don't want bankers to get caught up in this is you've got to have one of these paths for you to get a cannabis banking program. There's such a a, a disconnect and that also being a rebuttal for people who who don't want to serve their their communities or or get into cannabis banking from that perspective because they don't they're waiting for one of these to pass. When in the reality, there's not been a bank that's held been been legally held liable for that cannabis banking program unless they have systemic failures within their institution that that they are not actually running a reasonable and achievable program at their institution. That's coming from the regulator side. There has not been anybody who has had some, their charter revoked, anything like that because of whatever these protections, the Safe Banking Act says they're gonna provide for that. So it's really, it's a frustrating event to have to continue to talk through. My husband says all the time, he's like, ooh, they're gonna pass, uh, you know, look like they're voting on that. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, call me when it's actually done because it's, it just, it's, it is, it, it is irritating from that perspective. You don't have to wait on that to get into cannabis. You don't have to, you know, we can talk through that. That could be a whole other webinar, but, you know, I work with institutions in, who are in states where cannabis is not legal. So I live in North Carolina, will probably be one of the very last states to ever legalize cannabis. Uh, and I have banks in North Carolina who are headquartered in North Carolina that are banking cannabis legal cannabis in states that it's been legally passed. So you don't even have to be chartered in a state where it's legal. I mean, there are ways to serve the cannabis industry uh, and and your institution being a state that it's not legal. So I think it, these are conversations that there's a lot of misleading things that come out of everybody waiting on this federal you know, legalization. And we don't want to get into politics or anything, but we know this is probably going to just take forever once, if it does pass, how long is it going to take for FinCEN to do anything to change our current uh, burdens of banking cannabis, SARS filings, that and ever? You know, they are supposedly going to have 18 months to move the needle and give us new guidance. But we're still working on cannabis banking guidance that turns a decade old this year, right? So let's just not get caught up in this legalization conversation, uh, you know, from the federal side, because we ain't going to get anywhere anytime soon talking about it. So let us be your guide on kind of walking you through. If you're in a state where cannabis is not legal or it's becoming legal, or you're thinking about banking other states, let's, let's talk about that because there are ways you can do it and do it well and do it very successfully and not, not be dependent on waiting your state to actually move the needle on cannabis itself or from a federal level getting it changed. Great points, Chris. And actually, that's a great segue now into the next section, too, which is really what are some of those bankers thinking about? What's on their minds as they consider getting into it or as they consider expanding? Because we're at this point now within the industry where um, we're actually seeing a lot more banks really thinking seriously about this and what the opportunities are for fee income, uh, certainly uh, on the minds of most bankers today. So in the context of all these trends and challenges, we did reach out to FI professionals to capture kind of a voice of the banker perspective on cannabis banking. So let's take a look at what they found and some of the opportunities and challenges. So let's start with, first of all, the expectations uh, on the current status of cannabis banking. And what we're finding is that um, most bankers are feeling very positive about banking cannabis overall and in general. So their view of the future, the outlook ahead for 2024 and beyond has actually been um, still very, uh, very positive. But even while two thirds of institutions will not likely um, engage in banking cannabis, those that do not currently banking uh, bank it, they still have a fairly positive view of the industry in general. So we're finding that as we have discussions, and I think like you've said, Kristen, a lot of bankers uh, while they might feel uh, positive or strong about the future of cannabis banking, um, they're in institutions that obviously don't share that view or for a variety of reasons uh, will probably not bank cannabis anytime in the near future. But it is interesting that overall the perspective of this industry has been uh, fairly positive um, from both those in it and those who are um, considering to get in it. And um, a slide that we had uh, produced out of our prior research and found that it still holds true 
really bifurcate uh, the view of the financial professional into two groups. One are those institutions that do not currently bank um, cannabis-related businesses, CRBs, and those that do. And what we're finding is uh, those that don't, most of the challenges and the roadblocks that they're facing are fairly well known and, and discussed. They're things like the illegality, everything we've just discussed, right, Kristen? I mean, the illegality of it uh, at the federal level, the compliance challenges, the reporting challenges, uh, internally board objections and those objections from senior management, uh, reputational risks, and, and last but not least, but something near and dear to our heart is obviously education and training. Um, if you compare and contrast that to banks that have been in the uh, cannabis industry now for a couple of years, um, what we're finding is education and training continues to be a top priority, but it shifts. Uh, certainly compliance is important, but you start to see that these banks that have now gotten past the initial hurdle of compliance and they've got a program set up in place, they've got um, technology in place that helps them stay compliant, that the question shifts to more of a traditional industry. Uh, so as banks get into new industries, let's say flooring loans, or, or um, I worked with a bank that did private aircraft lending, um, now you're faced with how do I deal with competition? How do I get my pricing in line? Um, how do I increase fees? What about uh, customer objections to some of the services that we can or can't offer? These are, I think, questions that banks and credit unions are obviously more experienced in dealing with. So if they can get past the initial hurdle and into uh, more of a business as usual ongoing process, we find that the challenges that they face start to mirror those that they encounter with any new industry that they may look to get into uh, in the future. Um, Kristen, any other thoughts on this? Yeah, I think a lot of the times when they're not in to this space initially in the discovery phase, right, is they don't know what they don't know. And that's because there's frankly not a whole lot of education. And you guys are in that field of educating and have created such good content for that, that that's a good spot to start. That didn't exist when cannabis first came out, right? Like hemp or cannabis, really. It was like, ooh, let me figure out. I've got this guy that's, that's two and a half pages long from the government that kind of tells me what to do, but I really don't know what I don't know. And I'm just a banker, right? I don't know what cannabis looks like here. I've got board of directors who think of Woodstock and that land of cannabis. They don't realize that it's much more than what it was back in the 60s and 70s, right? That, it, that communities are thriving in this space. So I think that is an inherent problem is the, I don't know what I don't know. And I don't know how to properly educate people on, to, on how to get comfortable in this space, because regardless of whether or not you're going to bank it, you feel like you're going to actively bank it or not. You're going to have, if you're in a community where cannabis is legal, you're going to have cannabis funds running through your institution, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. And not acknowledging it is willful blindness, frankly. So right really sitting down and thinking about is it easier to just bank it because you know you're crossing a line for lack of a better term and you know you've got these set things for SAR filings what you should be doing from a due diligence perspective so on and so forth there if you don't bank cannabis it's almost harder because you're having to like teach your front line how to screen them out you don't know who's coming through the door because they may come under the guise of somebody else. Maybe they're an existing customer who don't know any better to tell you that they're in cannabis, right? And then they start commingling funds and you've got this weird, you know, if you just come out with a statement and say, we're going to explore this because it's in our community and then go through the analysis of whether or not it's the right thing to do or wrong thing to do, your regulators are going to expect that you have thought through this. If you're in a community that has cannabis, your regulators are going to say, what are you doing about it? If you're not banking it, Prove to me how you're not banking it. What are your processes and your procedure? What's your policy say? If you are banking it, prove it. Prove how you are building a reasonable and achievable program, right? There's all sorts of over-designed programs that have failed because they go and these bankers think that they need to be the police. You know, they need to be out there being the FBI in these places. That's not the case. There are reasonable ways to achieve a program that meets regulatory expectations, that is can be run with a one or two person team, uh, that can be done run really well and successfully. But again, you have to, you can't ignore that it's in your community. So document, document, document. 
did, am I going to do it? And am I not going to do it? And if either decision, how are you going to achieve that at your institution? Great insights, Kristen. Absolutely. Um, let's, we, we've talked on this a little bit too, on the outlook around um, cannabis related businesses. And what we're finding is um, that bankers are hearing that of the business owners out there currently, 59% have a fairly or actually very uh, positive outlook for their own businesses, whether they're in the uh, cultivation or the dispensary, um, that they're hearing that these um, perspectives are very positive. However, when they take a look at the industry overall from these DRBs, um, they're seeing some warning signs. And I think they relate back to what I was talking about earlier in some of the industry introduction pieces, which is about the contraction of the industry, the overgrowth in certain states. I know here in New Mexico, um, there's been a lot of discussion about how the proliferation of cannabis licenses in the state has really led to it being not just uh, oversaturated, but they've run into compliance issues with cannabis being brought in from out of state, which is a clear violation. Um, so they're finding that in a state with only a population of 2 million, that they've really kind of oversaturated the market. And I think we're starting to see that, that um, while business owners feel positive about their own businesses, they don't um, necessarily feel quite as positive about the industry or the market that they may be in right now, simply because it may be going through a period of contraction or, or uh, shrinkage. Yeah, I really think, Mike, this is really dependent more on what state that you are in, right? Like you just said, New Mexico, Oklahoma is a great example. They're uh, very saturated with licenses and those that serve their, their community, those banks and credit unions that serve their community are seeing this contraction of folks that are being, you know, viable customers that they would want or, or members that they would want to have in their financial institution that meets their program goals because these businesses, their contraction means that their profit is less, right? Like they can't yep. sell a, their, their price per item is, you know, 50% less than it was in the previous year. So they can't pay the fees to the institutions that they once could. So it's really important when you're in this getting into this field or if you're already in it constant market analysis around you is going to help you stay competitive yeah. but also don't paint yourself in a corner to say you're only going to bank one state because my oklahoma institutions that bank cannabis are out are going out of state are are offering cannabis banking to out of state yeah. folks because they need more business that is more profitable in states that all, you know, have kind of have their ducks in a row a little bit better and can help these businesses get off their on, on their feet correctly. Right. So make sure when you are building out this program that you don't pin yourself in a quarter with your policy saying you're only going to bank this one state. Consider on a case by case basis that you might go out of state. And that may take some that's going to take some conversations, board buy in, understanding, having the right technology, the right processes in place to understand what those nuances are in those other states, how is the cash logistics going to work if that's involved, so on and so forth. There's lots of conversations that have to happen around there. But it's, you know, just just be cognizant that your opportunities aren't just necessarily pinned to your own state. You can bank out of state even if you're not chartered in those states. And I think a lot of people aren't aware of that, Kristen. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, they really need to explore some of those other options. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to go through a few of the other findings that kind of jumped out at us, um, one of the things that we also found that the primary reasons for why institutions actually are got into it or are getting into it um, is really narrowed down to expanding the services that the institution offers and to increase the overall access to market opportunities within their state or within their region, their area, their district, what have you. And what we found is that there were 39 and 37 percent of respondents um, who were actually looking at expanded services, but we're finding that that is really most notable among those under $5 billion. So we're still seeing this as a community bank credit union kind of uh, environment play where these smaller institutions are really trying to see it as an opportunity to 
strengthen their footprint within their local community and get a leg up on the fact that the larger uh, institutions like U.S. Bank, B of A, Wells Fargo are still, while we know that they're looking at cannabis, I mean, we know that they've got teams uh, like MasterCard and Visa as well who are researching this, they're still not getting in there in these smaller community and super community banks see, uh, see the opportunity and are, are really trying to see it as a way to grow their portfolio within their marketplace. Yeah, and what's interesting too, Micah, you know, when cannabis banking was first becoming like really blowing up, it started to happen around the same time the pandemic happened. So you had all the PPP loans in, so it was banks and credit unions were saturated with deposits. So their drive was fee income, right? Like they they knew there was an opportunity for fee income. There wasn't a lot of institutions in this space that were wanting to uh, get into it. So these these players, these businesses in cannabis needed a place to deposit. So they pay fees out the wazoo, right? Now you have banks that are on the opposite and credit unions on the opposite side where it's like, I need deposits now. Right. PPP is not not covering me anymore. And you're seeing this, dec- this shift, this like paradigm shift of their, how do, okay, so if, if deposits are my goal, but I can't, you know, there's other institutions that are now in this space that are offering a lot less fees. There's strategies to, you know, it, getting your program goals in place. And, you know, we can, we're, I'm happy to talk to anybody about that, but it's really interesting how the different reasons these institutions get into it. And a lot of it, I would like to say is good at heart. I want to serve my community, but at the end of the day, we're still a bit, banks and credit unions are still a business. They're still a business. They need to make profit. They need to do pay the bills, their people, so on and so forth. So, there's, you know, smart ways to say, okay, I do want to serve my community. That's the right thing to do. But what is my goal beyond that? And then really kind of comparing your program to others so that you can be competitive enough to take folks away from those other institutions potentially. Exactly. And, and we're seeing more and more banks faced with those challenges and how to grapple with them. We didn't see that maybe two or three years ago. There just wasn't enough presence within the marketplace for that to be a driving question or concern. Right. And what you can also find in Mike, too, is that like, when I used to have an old banker I worked with. He said, Kristen, people aren't going to switch banks unless they're mad at their bank. <laughs> right. They're not going to go through the whole rigmarole of switching all your ACHs and all this, this, that, and the other. I, Maybe that's true for cannabis. Maybe that's still true for other industries as well. And I, I believe it's still true to an extent. But if you can beat them on fees, if you can pay them more on their deposits, they're going to be more likely to move if they're not mad at you, right? But in cannabis too, the other in- the consideration should also be a lot of these need backup institutions because they've already had the pool- rug pulled out from them probably at an institution or two that had a thriving cannabis program had management changes, you get somebody in there who doesn't like cannabis, rips the program away, and then this this business is left high and dry, but for, right. for lack of a better term. Um, and so I think there's really, really, really some strategic thinking that has to go into this, and you really need really need to help to at kind of looking at the more like high level 10,000 foot view and, and partner with some folks that have already seen what it's like at other institutions who are doing the same goal exactly. searching as you are. And, and, and you're likely to, you know, your ROI is likely to kick in quicker from that if you put that kind of thought into it. And, and it's clear, again, and this like kind of reinforces what the other one said too, this is really a play still for the smaller institutions, the ones under five or 10 billion that we're seeing that, um, their view of the industry, again, is is much more positive, somewhat better uh, in, in terms of, well, through 2023, 2024 even, that there's much more optimism among those banks. But that makes sense because they're the ones in the market. Um, the ones who are sitting on the sidelines probably aren't staying as on top of the industry as the smaller institutions are. So some of my most successful cannabis banking program customers are three, two to three hundred million dollars in asset. And then I have customers all the way up, you know, wow. 10 billion, whatever. But it just shows that you can do it successfully no matter the size of the institution, right? As long as you have the right tools in your pocket, the right resources, the right partnerships to help you get it right from the very beginning. So you're not scrambling trying to do things manually uh, after your program has blown up 
before you even realized. I'm telling you all this as somebody is say, saying somebody, don't make the same mistakes I did. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> I've done been there and done it. So I'm I'm teaching you from my heart here of saying, I've made them those mistakes of, of thinking that my program was going to be itty bitty tiny. And then, you know, before I know it, everybody and their brother is there wanting to bank with you. And you haven't thought through like, okay, what's my capacity? What's my technical? you know, what's my technology look like? What's this look like? That look like? So, uh, you know, just don't, don't be me. Don't, don't be making those same mistakes I did way back when. <laughs> <laughs> Let me help you through that. <laughs> well, it, it's funny because one of the areas that, um, that we do again, hear a lot from, uh, from bankers and credit unions, about, especially the smaller ones, is the huge investment in compliance staffing required before you get into this. Uh, we've heard ratios of everywhere from uh, 10 plus or minus 10 accounts requiring one BSA officer for every eight to 10 accounts, and then uh, even more. So you could see when asked about um, what the level of compliance requirements are for BSA AML staffing, you can see the vast majority uh, are saying either more or much more requirements. So is this is really, and this is an area, Kristen, I think you guys see probably more than almost anyone, which is the investment that, that uh, community banks and, and credit unions who maybe uh, have only had a handful of compliance people in the past suddenly have to really ratchet this up, even if they only have a couple of branches. Um, yeah. I imagine you're seeing that also. Well, I think there's a big misunderstanding here, right? I think that people who are not, haven't really had the right conversations with the right right folks that have been in there want to just assume you have to have a ton of compliance people, right? But it's either you hire people or you get technology. You're always going to have to have some people, right? The technology is not going to do everything, but you got to have a right balance technology too. That isn't giving you so much information that it's not even your responsibility to deal with. That's when you get into having to ramp up your staffing. Either you're ramping up your staffing because you're doing everything manually or you've chosen a software, I don't know why my th- thumb's up there on that <laughs> screen, but, uh, or you've chosen a software that is overkill on what your actual responsibilities for BSA and AML is, right? Again, it's not your job to police the industry. It's your job to ensure that the activity occurring in these accounts is commensurate with the stated nature of the business and that there's not any illicit activity happening in there. It doesn't have to be this big rigmarole that everybody creates in this, right? We have to have a balance. And you don't learn that unless you have worked at an institution that is teeny tiny with minimal staffing, right? You have to say, how can I do this faster, quicker, better so that I can scale up this program, but still not have to add staff for every 10 customers that I bring on? So we have uh, you know, work with institutions on staffing plans and ROI calculators and saying, this is what you would do if you did it manually. This is what you would do it if you did it with risk scale. This is what if you did it with, and you're finding that for, you know, really for most of our customers, our larger institutions, it's one employee, one employee dedicated for every 100 accounts. It's not, it, and that's because you have the right. So it's not the scary it's numbers. Like, it's not scary. It's not scary. Like from that perspective. So, have the right conversations. Don't let people scare you in a corner. Don't automatically assume that you got to hire a whole army of people because when you can set up a reasonable, balanced program that meets regulatory expectations, that's not turning a wolf with blind eye at stuff, that is being thorough, but not overkill, you're going to find that the staffing burden is way less than what these other people are telling you it needs to be or what you might be assuming it needs to be. It, it's almost reminiscent. Uh, I, I was Go going to say it's reminiscent of when um, the Patriot Act first passed and right. banks were used to still doing manual aggregation of deposits at the branch level to make sure that people weren't going into multiple branches to make multiple deposits. And then the Patriot Act kind of put a massive burden on banks to have to keep track of this, which they fully weren't equipped to do. And then technology came in. Uh, it right. wasn't perfect at first, but you know, tools like Yellowhammer and others came into the scene and really helped automate this process. And what you're describing is kind of the same situation where um, the technology now is seen as a way of 
avoiding this type of compliance demand that many small institutions may be trying to muscle this manually, as opposed to looking at technology as a way to help them stay compliant and take some of that burden and and legal responsibility off of your front line. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, BSA people, I'm guilty of it too, where our job is to say, what's the worst that could happen and then work our way backwards from that, right? So if we're not educated and we assume that and we haven't looked in the to the tools available or had the right conversations, we're automatically going to be like, yeah, we need seven more staffing members for this because we don't want to be stuck in an orange jumpsuit that we all assume we're going to be in because <laughs> we violated some BSA rule, right? So just, right. again, it goes back to having the right conversations with the right people to help educate you on what it is to logically build out one of these that's reasonable and scalable, even at a teeny, teeny, tiny institution with one or two employees. Um, just very quickly touch on this one. I, th I think it kind of highlights the technology question you were just addressing, Kristen, which is um, what's the reliance on third parties that institutions are taking right now? And what we're finding is that more than a third rely, at least in some part, on third party trainers or some type of support for de developing and delivering their training. Um, more than a, a, a fifth said that they're actually trying to do this all internally. And what's really kind of frightening, I think, is the, the that last one, that 45% either said they don't have training at all um, or worse yet, that they um, don't feel as though that they need it. And I think we're really seeing here that relying on outside parties uh, is just a way of really ensuring that you're staying on top of the industry, the regulations. I mean, we even find it's really hard for us to stay on top of everything every day. This is just an industry that changes um, on the turn mm -hmm. of a dime. Yeah. And, you know, oh. third parties, I think, are, are going to prove to be some of these banks' uh, greatest friends as trying to navigate these waters. If you're a banker at a teeny, teeny, tiny institution with 25 employees total, or you're at an institution with 1,000 to employees total, you all still have jobs, and some of you wore multiple, multiple hats. Do you have time to go in and dig every day to see what's changed? Mm -hmm. No, you barely have time to do your current job. Let the people who are paid to do this, are the experts in this field, give you the information you need to make risk-based, better, more informed decisions at your institution based because it's their job to inform you. And it doesn't have to cost you an arm and a leg. It can be through you know, free webinars. It can be through, you know, partnerships where people are just, you know, putting out, you know, like the ACBA, putting out information when, when it comes to fruition in that state that maybe you hadn't known about, maybe you hadn't thought about, you know, we send out updates to our institutions when something has changed in their state that they need to consider, or if we're seeing tips and tricks and, and, and trends of maybe potential red flags that they haven't considered. So partner with somebody, an organization, or your technology provider should, if you have a technology provider, they should be helping you provide you updates on stuff you should be considering for your own program. So you don't know what you don't know. You're not <laughs> going to have time to keep up with it and let the people that do know help you through that pathway. Perfect. Couldn't have said it better myself, Kristen. Uh, so as we near the end of our, our hour, um, we did want to recap a few of the other highlights that came out of the research, which we think um, bear mentioning that people should really um, should really think about. Most of these, I think, are going to be like we know that already. But for example, there's been a marked increase in the recreational cannabis nationally. Uh, we saw that with the last election. Uh, we're still seeing states migrate over from medical to recreational. Um, and again, the research really supports that. Um, what we found that was different from the last time we did the research also is when asked about how they how bankers felt that their fees compared to other comparable institutions, um, we're starting to see that there's the, the competition's having an effect on fees. We know a year ago when we talked to CRBs, uh, many of them still felt that the uh, the fees that they were being charged were usurious. Um, you know, some were saying as much as $1,500 a month to $2,000 a month. We're starting to find that the they're reporting now that the impact from competition is starting to force some of these banks to rethink their pricing strategy on here. This isn't just meant to be a slot machine for bankers. Um, it's really meant to be a long-term strategy for rela uh, relationship management. 
And I think that's, and we mentioned this before, number three, that smaller institutions continue to express greater optimism uh, for growing their CRB portfolio uh, this year and beyond. Um, we're still concerned about regulation. Bankers are still expressing their, their concern about the status on safe, safer state, all of the uh, Banking Act, because it do, until those things get resolved to some extent, each state having to kind of navigate these waters on their own. Um, we're seeing more support now for C to scale. Whereas two years ago when we did the research, much of the focus was on dispensaries and frontline operations. We're finding uh, some banks are really taking the time to learn what they need to know about chemical analysis and things like that. If they're really going to jump into this, into the cultivation and manufacturing side. Um, so it's nice to see at least some banks are getting into this in a more committed way. Um, six, there's been discussion kind of on the periphery um, around insurance and the availability or uh, inaccessibility of, of getting necessary insurance policies and, and insurance documentation. We're hoping to see more emphasis on this in the year ahead. Uh, we know more bankers are asking for this type of documentation uh, up front, and we're seeing that this is an area where really the industry can uh, can address some need to um, to step up. And then last but not least, um, the duration with which institutions have um, stayed in this have remained largely unchanged. We've seen more and more people staying within here. We've also seen some institutions start to drop out uh, and start to say it's not worth the investment or it's not worth the hassle. Um, these are just some top line findings out of our research. Any thoughts on this, Kristen? Yeah, I would say, you know, while we are seeing some institutions drop out, I have had more conversations in the last six weeks. And, you know, usually in the banking world, December through January is dead, right? <laughs> like the bankers are just having a hard time waking up from holiday hangovers, whatever, whatever. I have had more conversations on starting new cannabis banking programs in the last six weeks than I've had my whole time here at Risk Health. So I would say that we're seeing a really big peak in interest. And there are some states that have legalized it. So people are getting familiar or wanting to get familiar, wanting to know what their options are, whatnot, whatnot. But we're seeing a lot of these conversations happen in states that have been legal for a long time. So I think they're doing their own market analysis to say, OK, these people are dropping out. What What's their reason why? Under, and get them more understanding and, and starting to see that there are needs in their community that are still unmet in this space and wanting to get into it. So those have been really fun conversations. I love, love, love having those conversations with folks because <laughs> there's a lot to consider, but we can do it quickly. Right. There, there are smart ways to go about you know, figuring out whether this is the right or, or wrong path for your institution. So we wanted to wrap up with some actionable takeaways, some things that everyone on the call can um, hopefully start to think about and take advantage of today, as opposed to waiting for two years to get through committees and things like that. These are these are some suggestions that we feel can make an impact on your organization as you either continue down the path of getting into cannabis banking, if you're already there, if you're just considering it. Uh, training and education, obviously we're biased on this one. We believe strongly in education um, in supporting this. Uh, so we see an educational framework. You really have to feel very comfortable with your education internally to your existing staff, both the operations, the front line, as well as thinking about the education that you want to impart on your CRBs that come in. So don't leave them out of your educational uh, equation. Make sure that your frontline staff have ed, uh, materials to educate the CRBs very clearly spelled out um, so that they can walk away, get you the documentation you need and, and not have to worry about um, uh, doing this seven, eight, nine times. So we feel that the educational framework is both of, of your existing staff, as well as for your uh, CRBs. And to that end, certification, um, as we mentioned earlier, we launched the first um, kind of banking education uh, certification back in, gosh, 2020. And we feel that that type of documentation, through having a certificate good for two years that demonstrates that you, you understand beyond just the coal memo, you understand the things that we've been talking about uh, this morning. So that certification, we're also working on an onboarding package that banks can impart on their CRB so that, it, call it like certification light. So they can come in showing that their employees have all been certified and uh, understand 
the basic terminology, the basic compliance requirements so that bankers can feel more comfortable that these businesses are also proactively taking a step to educate their staff and can demonstrate it by uh, production of certificates. Um, ongoing education, regardless of where you are in this process, this has to be a top priority because these rules, the compliance change, and the last thing you want are your regulators coming in saying, no, that was last year. You're now out of compliance because you didn't educate your staff this year. So ongoing refresher education, uh, frontline back office, um, even if you're not formally banking cannabis, this has to be a priority. And then last but not least, the executive training. Um, we know that uh, the time and schedules of your executive staff, your board of directors is very limited, but it is necessary for them to also understand what their exposure is, their risk exposure in this area. So we emphasize the need to make sure that your executives are all um, are all trained and on board. This doesn't have to be the same comprehensive training that your frontline staff receive. But it is absolutely important that your executive staff understands what's going on, what this means, what the risks are, and what the opportunities are as well. Yeah, they're the ones ultimately responsible for the bank. Absolutely. Uh, and, and they're, the, <laughs> they're also the ones who say no the most often. So That's true. educating That's true. them can help More get them compliance. <laughs> yeah. Dispel those myths. A lot of the ones that you've been talking about, Kristen, today, if, if if we accomplish one thing through this webinar, and that's to get the FIs who are on this webinar to feel empowered to be able to at least articulate why some of the myths, some of the uh, uh, incorrect information that their board of directors or that their executives may have, to feel empowered to be able to address those logically and without, you know, in any way getting them defensive. So hopefully if we've accomplished yeah. that, we did our mission today. Um, a couple of the other areas which I know risk outs heavily involved in, and which really, gosh, we found institutions all over the board, and that's site visits and onboarding. Would you like to speak to these, Kristen? Yeah, absolutely. Site visits are highly, highly encouraged, right? Especially at onboarding. You got to know that business exists, guys. Is it there? And how the site visits are conducted is that's an optional thing for you. I know some folks do it virtually. That kind of makes me nervous, right? How are, are you sure that's happening at that address they gave you? Is that their real business? I don't know. I get, I you know, I think everybody's laundering money and trafficking a human, right? That's just <laughs> that's the, 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 the curse of the Bank Secrecy Act in my blood, right? Uh, but the I think it's really important that you do a, a site visit, at least at onboarding. Now, the risk-based decision initially when cannabis banking first came out was to say, okay, yeah, you absolutely have to do one annually after that. We're seeing a shift in that that's being adopted, which is more of saying side visits should be conducted at onboarding, but then on a risk-based decision, case-by-case -case scenario after that. So if you see a big significant change in you know, the behavior of the business, maybe their business model has changed. Listen, you can go do a site visit all you want. Doesn't mean you know what you're looking at, right? You're not a, an expert, a scientist, a person who knows the, what all the licensees should have here and there. So it's a possibility that partnering with a, a company that uh, is well-versed in what those businesses should be doing, that's a that's a really important too. Now, understand if they're a licensed cannabis business, then they have somebody going and doing site visits there on, on occasion, right? From the state, they're a licensee. Uh, so there's all sorts of ways, but you know, really getting in there and helping streamline those site visits is important because it's not always the BSA staffing going out there doing it. So having a tool where you can streamline those site visits, uh, whether regardless of what staffing is going out there, so they can document and get that information uh, documented for the BSA team to review is super important. And then onboarding, you need to be doing your due diligence, people. You need to uh, really get in there and understand that business so that you can understand, do they fit your, not only your risk appetite, but your program goals. And there's, you know, doing that manually is a big old pain in the butt. Trust me, I've been there, done that, don't want you to do that. Uh, so you need to not only uh, get in there and have a good solid onboarding process, but you need to trust but verify, right? So is that business uh, doing what they say they're doing? Are they appropriately licensed? Are there any red flags beyond what I have been told? 
So having a right tool in your pocket for that is really important too. We we have what we call first pass at risk count where anybody who onboards through the software uh, can't gets a due diligence report afterwards and we're looking to make sure the CIP information is correct and the uh, there's no adverse media and that they're appropriate licensed and so on and so forth. And we can turn around that report within several several minutes to back to our institution so they can make quicker, more risk-based informed decisions on whether or not they want to bank this business or and, not. And that's respectful for both the bank's time and the CRB's time. So, you know, if we can speed up that decision-making uh, and if it's a negative decision, I think at least CRB is going to respect the fact that you didn't waste weeks of their time to get to that point. Yeah. Onboarding doesn't have to be as difficult as people make it out to be. <laughs> like I hear, I've been at, you know, the PBC conference for years and years hearing people say onboarding takes, can take up to six weeks. What are you doing? <laughs> right. What are you doing? And it, that's a lot of times you hear that it's because they're trying to do it manually or they preliminarily approve them, but they're trying to get attached into their seed to sales system for whatever tracking they have. And that takes forever. Um, so there's better, smarter ways to go about uh, being able to track what your businesses are doing that you're banking as well, that we can turn around most of our institutions on board folks within 48 hours. You know, I think and that's, that's key. Well, what about due yeah. diligence, Kristen? The due diligence effort has to come uh, from, you know, a line of questioning that is driven to help you understand that business and really understand what not only they are, who they are today, but who they want to be long term, right? Uh, that who they are today, you, you, they also don't know who, who they're going to be long term a lot of the times because mm -hmm. what we find is the, the business that is who they are today, who you onboard it's probably not the same business a year from now, right? They've either become a vertical, they've merged, they've shedded a part of their business, so on and so forth. So it's not just about understanding who they are from a due diligence side at onboarding, but knowing them long-term, that's part of know your customer, know your businesses, right? And having tools in your pocket too, to help you understand that business, not just at, at, at onboarding, but throughout the life cycle of that relationship with you is important. So you can understand whether the activity occurring in the account is commensurate with the stated nature of the business at is, as it is today and not who they were on at onboarding a year or two ago. Right. right? A dynamic process. Sure. Yeah. Lay right. the right expectations with that business too, that you're going to be, you know, sending them out a questionnaire every six months to just re-verify the nature of the business and get any business updates. Let them have those proactive conversations that if something is big shifting for them, they need to let you know. They have to, you have to really set the right expectations that say, help me defend why I chose to bank you. And that's only going to be fruitful for both of us if we have a ongoing dynamic conversation relationship where we keep each other informed, right? So. Exactly. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up here, um, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to to mention about an upcoming webinar. We we certainly want everyone to take advantage of the additional training and in, informational resources that are available both through Risk Scout and through the ACBA. Um, a quick uh, plug for your SAR Wars. Yeah, absolutely. We are doing a, a a SAR webinar on the 21st of February. I'm really excited. I love talking about SARS. SARS can be super controversial, right? Um, there are smart ways to do SARS. There are really not smart ways to do SARS. We'll talk up a little bit about SARS in relation to cannabis and priority SARS versus limited SARS and, and the $0 SAR filing for the limited SARS. That's so controversial. Uh, so let's get into that. Let's. I'd love for you guys to sign up. Uh, you're really going to find a lot of value on this. I've worked with law enforcement a lot on, in the past on, you know, these same webinars. So a lot of information from them that really is going to feed. Uh, and you will, you'll find that, you know, even if you're a teeny tiny institution, that's where the bad actors to tend to go. So um, you're not, you're not out of, uh, they think that you're not sophisticated enough to, to uh, detect the illicit activities. So you probably have the juicy of stuff happening at your institution and uh, we need a way to get that information to law enforcement so you can make an impact in that. So I'm really excited to talk through all that with you guys. Well said, Kristen, thank you. Um, last but not least, we do wanna encourage people to consider ACBA memberships. We have individual uh, bank and credit union memberships as well as corporate memberships. 
um, for the FI memberships and corporate, as you'll see, uh, your single membership for the year entitles everyone within your organization have access to our webinars, our uh, advisory council, if you're a bank or credit union, that's only FI, that's not uh, open to others, um, as well as a number of other uh, resources at your disposal. So we encourage you to take a look at it. It's at the ACBA.org. Um, again, like to thank uh, Kristen Parker, and our contact information for uh, both the ACBA and Risk Scout is here on the screen. And with that, I'm going to hand the floor back to Aaron. Great. Thank you so much, Mike and Kristen, for this wealth of information. We are approaching the top of the hour, and we do have some questions that have come in. I'm just going to ask two quick questions, and then we will take the rest as a frequently asked questions document, and we will send that out to all of the attendees. All right, so quick questions. First, um, Mike, this one's for you. Can we expect to see more survey data results in the future? Um, absolutely. This was our second iteration of the research. We did our other one about 18 months ago. We want to keep this going to get a voice of the banker and ultimately a voice of the CRB as well. So yes, we're anticipating having a updated research study uh, towards probably around uh, Q3, just to make sure that we're staying on top of any changing perspectives or attitudes within the industry. Wonderful. Uh, next question, Kristen, I'm gonna send this one over to you. How can I better navigate the profitability versus reputational risk conversation with my board as we work to develop our cannabis program? Great, great question. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you need to have some good conversations with folks that have been in this space before, right? You need to come up with uh, you know, a, pro a pros and cons list, right? Uh, you need to understand the ROI of what this program is going to take to run and give present them the different um, options for whether you're running a manual program with technology. These are the potential reputational risks. Do, are we going to be public about this? Or are we going to be hush-hush private about it? There are all sorts of things to consider. Um, so I have some tools that I'm happy to, you know, walk you through and, and provide you on how to have those conversations. And then we work with a lot of institutions, um, having conversations with not only their board of directors, helping them through those conversations one on one or with the group of board of directors. But also, it's very, very important that you have a conversation with your regulator before you get into this. You don't ask them permission unless you're in trouble. If you've had a you know, write up, you might want to ask them permission, but you tell them you're getting into this and what your plan is so that they are well informed too. So we are involved in those conversations as well. Um, so, you know, lots to think through. We could talk hours about this, but I won't bore you guys to death. Just reach out, I, I, I got your back. Great, Kristen. Yes, I've seen the risk out tools, um, at least some of them that Kristen is talking about. So feel free to reach out. She's a great starting point, just a wealth of information. So I want to thank both Mike Beard and Kristen Parker from Risk Out for joining us today. Folks, we're going to have, we're going to get more questions in. We have more questions. We're going to do that frequently asked questions document. We're going to send that to you with the recorded session today and the deck that is going to come to you via email within 24 hours. So I hope everybody has is going to have a wonderful day today and we look forward to seeing you at another event soon. Thanks again, everyone.